Hi everybody, Mr. Farmer here, and today we're going to go through all the major graphs of microeconomics. First off, we have the production possibility curve. Uh, the table version is the production possibility frontier. So in this version, we have one person or one company, and they can produce output B or output A. And so they can produce anywhere on this curve. We'll say this blue curve is going to be our current full employment. Uh, this shows increasing opportunity cost is the main concept here, which is why at first when you go from here to producing seven units, you don't give up that much. You give up one unit and you gain quite a bit, uh, about two and a half units, some of that range. But when you give up this last unit of this B, you don't really gain all that much, so you don't gain as much Again, that's the increasing opportunity cost, a lot of increasing opportunity cost. This can also be used when we're talking about absolute and compared advantage, uh, which would eventually go into international trade. Uh, this is where you look at the opportunity cost. So if we have green and blue, uh, blue can produce B and A, eight and eight of each. Uh, and then this is going to be blue over here. And then we have green and they can produce B and A, eight and 10 and you again you simplify the equation one to one one to ten eighths five fourths uh, and so this means that blue has a compared advantage to production of whatever b is and a and the economic gains and all those kinds of things can also play this role but again production possibility curve on the production side the business side the budget line would be the version on the consumer side Next one is the circular flow. Uh, so this one, you need to know what the flows are. So we have households on one side and businesses on the other. Occasionally, you can have government in the middle. So you have the product market where goods and services are being sold um, <clears throat> from the firms over to the households. And then you have the resource or factor market, which is where the factors of production, the land, labor, capital, entrepreneurial abilities, are being sold to the firm. In exchange, you get the money. So the exterior flow on this one, at least, is that income, that dollar value. Supply and demand, all oh, simpler times. Now, the acronym I use is insect and petting. For insects, the this is on the demand. So we have income, number of consumers, substitute goods, expectations, complementary goods, and finally taste and preference. So these are going to be changes in demand, meaning the demand curve itself would shift to the left or to the right. Next one is going to be, I use petting, so this is supply, and this is again going to be changes in supply, meaning the curve itself would actually move left or right. So we have productivity, and I usually think labor for this one, expectation, taxes and subsidies, technology, input cost, number of suppliers, and that would be increasing the firms in the overall industry, again we're talking about the industry supply curve, and then government regulation. Along these lines we have elasticity, we have a couple Elasticity of demand, that's going to be the general characteristics. Um, is, are there a large number of substitutes? Are they perfectly substitutable? Is it need versus want? All those kinds of things. But usually when you look at this, you look at the price elasticity of demand, which is what these graphs are showing. Within a certain price range, how receptive was the change in the quantity demand at that dependent variable? Supplies the same thing, and then we have cross, which talks about is it a substitute or complementary goods. So you have two different goods there: good X, good Y, capital consumer, whatever else it is. And then income elasticity refers to uh, when there's a change in income, how reactive is the change in quantity demanded? So it talks about is it a normal good, meaning as your income increases, you buy more of it, or is it an inferior good, meaning as your income increases, you actually buy less of it. So you can use the midpoint formula or the elasticity coefficient. Both will get you the overall answer. So just some general rules really quick for price, uh, for demand elasticity of price and supply. 
it's the same rules. We use absolute values. So if it's greater than one, elastic, less than one, inelastic, and equal to one, unit elastic. For cross elasticity, if you come up with a positive outcome, that means the two goods are substitute. If you come up with a negative, they're complementary. And then for income, if you get a positive, it's a normal good, and a negative is going to be an inferior good. Later on, we look at this for monopolist competition, monopoly, uh, but really we look at this total revenue test to figure out when your March revenue is positive, that's this green curve here, when this is positive, you're in the elastic range. And again, the idea is we have a downward sloping demand curve. So as I produce more units, my price is decreasing. And if my March revenue is positive, that means my total revenue in this range from here down to the left, my total revenue is increasing. So price decreases, total revenue increases, elastic. And on the other side of this curve right here, on this right side of this little line right here, since my March revenue is now negative, that means my total revenue is decreasing. They both go in the same direction, price and total revenue, so we are in elastic. And then we're at zero, we are unit elastic, just kind of finish this out. More of a thing for a monopolist competition and monopolies, but it's worthwhile to note for when we're talking about elasticity. Consumer producer surplus. So consumer surplus is the area identifying how much additional surplus does the consumers gain for this. And so we compare the current price of the market compared to whatever they're willing to. And again, the, the demand curve is going to be the willingness, just like the supply curve is a willingness for the supply curve for the production of things so they have this much they thought they're going to spend five dollars or they thought they're going to have to spend ten dollars up here they only had to spend five so this one consumer gained five dollars of additional savings and that's an additional benefit we had all these up and they come with consumer surplus producer surplus same idea they were willing to sell for one dollar they get to sell for five so they get an additional surplus benefit of they get four extra dollars and three and two and one and 50 cents and whatever else. So we'd add all this area up to come up with this. If you're asked for the area, you would just use the base times height divided by two uh, just for that equation. And that's what we use. When these two areas are maximized, you are allocatively efficient. So what we will eventually say is when your supply is equal to your demand, meaning these areas are maximized, you are allocatively efficient. We do have price floors and price ceilings. This would be a government intervention here. So a price floor is a minimum legal price and a price ceiling is a maximum price. Now these are what's called effective, meaning they actually impact the price level. It is possible to have a minimum price of $2 that's still a price floor it doesn't do anything to the marketplace so it's ineffective but if it is a minimum it still meets the requirement of being a floor with that said we're going to assume that usually it does actually impact something and so then we have surpluses uh, and shortages so when your quantity supplied over here is larger than quantity demanded since it's greater this would be a surplus there's a larger amount available than is actually needed and then down here when your quantity demanded is going to be larger than your quantity supplied you have a shortage now this would cause uh, things like dead weight loss which is going to be this area so dead weight loss identifies that you are not allocatively efficient so you look at here's where your market is and we have a price ceiling that's why we're over here and so at that low of a price the producers say we don't want to produce that much so you have this market output but we want to be right here and then you fill in your demand and your supply and again one nice thing is the market points where it wants to go it wants to be allocatively efficient so then you just shade in that top of the area Business cost, a couple things to remember for this is we have the margin cost curve. This is based on the stages of production. So if you look at the marginal product, you have three stages, increasing, decreasing or diminishing, and then negative. Okay, so if we had a marginal product curve on here, it would look about like that. 
And this is going to help us represent uh, why these curves look the way they do. At first, we are better off with our variable resources. They're more efficient, so we go down. But then they start to go back up because we are basing it on fixed resources, fixed capital, whatever else it is. A couple other things to note. One is that the minimum ATC occurs where the marginal cost equals average total cost. If you're producing at that output, you are productively efficient. doesn't matter if you're pricing there. If you're at that quantity, you are there. Mathematically, the minimum AVC, average variable cost, is also where the March cost crosses. And the last thing we need to know is this. Average total cost minus average variable cost equals average fixed cost, which means the gap between here and here and anywhere else over there should equal the average fixed cost. That's going to come in play when we talk about um, minimizing loss for shutdown scenarios. Longer average total cost curve, it looks like a big old U where this one is a little more um, straight lines here. So we have um, economies of scale, increasing returns to scale, two technically different things, but we're not going to worry too much about that. Constant returns to scale, and the first unit of that is called minimum, e mi minimum <coughs> efficiency scale, and then from diseconomies of scale. So as you produce more units, you kind of get this diminished return aspect for fixed resources. You get more efficient, you get better output, better capital, uh, more specialization, but eventually it bottoms out and then it gets just too big. We can also talk about increasing and decreasing cost industries. And I use the long run curve uh, to help illustrate this. The increase in cost industries is the idea that as you add more firms, so all three of these are when there's a change to the number of suppliers, specifically an increase. As you increase number of suppliers and increase in cost industry, increase the cost. So it would be like going from AT6 to 7. So everything just gets more expensive because of the increase in demand on the resource market. Decrease in cost industry would be like going from ATC1 to 2. It's actually easier to produce. There's a resource market that's completely created at this point, so it's actually cheaper. And this would be what the entire industry would feel. Again, I'm kind of misusing the long run curve here, but it does work. The last one is the constant return. That would be going from like ATC3 to 4. This is our default. And the idea is that as more firms enter, you just stay where you are actually. And so there's no visible change to the cost curves that we look at. In the product market, we have four different market structures. Perfect competition, there's only one, perfect competition. And in perfect competition, there's monopolist competition, oligopoly, and monopoly. One thing to note is that we always use marginal revenue equal to marginal cost. That's going to be our productively efficient output. In perfect competition, there's zero deadweight loss, and in the long run, we're going to be productively efficient. That's why they're called perfect competition. For the imperfect competition, there's always going to be deadweight loss, meaning we're not socially optimum, and it's very unlikely for us to actually be producing at the productively efficient output, hence imperfect competition. So we have a couple different scenarios. So we have the shutdown, minimizing loss, break even, and profit. So if you look at this general cost curve, the idea is that if my price is greater than the ATC, so at our output, if my price is greater than my average total cost, like PH right here, I'm greater than ATC, so this would be my area of profit. We do this rectangle all the way across. If instead I'm equal right here, so depend, no matter how you find your output, once you're at your output, if it's equal to ATC, you break even. If you're in between your ATC and AVC, again, this is the part where it's important to remember the gap between ATC and AVC is your average fixed cost. So yes, if you're producing something like PM, you do lose money. You lose kind of the shaded in area right here, but you at least don't have to pay all this fixed cost, which would be from here to here. That's a lot more money. And right now you're only losing this much. 
so you minimize how much you lose. Last one is the shutdown. That's where if you have a price less than your uh, AVC, because at that point, let's say you're at PL, you have your fixed costs, which are fixed. No matter what you charge, you have that, but then you add additional costs on here. In this case, the AVC to here. You're adding on costs to yourself. Uh, that would be in addition to the fixed cost you're losing out on. So you don't want that to be happening. So here we have perfect competition. In perfect competition, we have a side-by-side -side graph. So we have industry on one side, and then this will be the firm on the other side. These guys are price takers uh, or price receivers. And so whatever the industry says, they're going to have going across. Okay, now if, for instance, they had been up here at first, then we'll say that's P1 and demand 1, margin revenue 1. At this point, they're producing at a profit, this much specifically. So in the long run, firms can enter into this market. And because they can enter in, they're going to keep entering, entering, entering until there's no longer motivation to enter, which is when they break even. So in the long run, they break even. So at this point, we're producing at our marginal revenue equal to our marginal cost. We always do that. But for perfect competition, my demand is equal to my marginal revenue. So demand equal to marginal cost, I am now allocatively efficient. I'm also, here's my consumer surplus and producer surplus. This area is also maximized. It's another hint for us. But I'm also producing in the long run at the break even, which means I'm producing at demand equal to average cost. So I'm producing at average cost equal to marginal cost. So I'm also productively efficient because when these two are equal, that's the minimum ATC or productive efficient output. So again, marginal revenue and marginal cost, uh, quantity uh, is going to go up to the demand curve, price equal to ATC, all that. Then we get monopolistic competition. Here it is as making a profit. You notice we now have a downward sloping demand curve, and then mathematically, we now are going to have a downward sloping marginal revenue curve that's less at all units. We still produce a marginal revenue equal to marginal cost. We're going to go up to our demand curve because we charge consumers exactly what they are willing to spend. And now again, I'm going to go down to my average total cost curve. So this would be my area of profit. Now this would be short run. I know that because I'm producing at a profit. Here they are producing at a loss. Now I don't know if it's minimizing or shutdown scenario because I don't have my average variable cost, but the idea is that yes, they can still lose. And let's just say I have my average variable cost curve about right there. This would then be a minimizing loss scenario because again, at this output right here at QM, I'm above my average variable cost, but below my average total cost. So I lose money, but I lose less by continuing to operate. But in the long run, they're going to break even. Firms are going to enter or leave until there's no longer motivation because there's still low barriers to entry. So now I break even. So let's look at this. So I produce a marginal revenue equal to marginal cost, still the same. But you notice my demand and marginal revenue are not equal. Okay, which means my demand is not equal to my marginal cost. So I am not allocatively efficient. Okay, and when I break even, my demand is equal to my average cost. But if average cost is equal to my demand, and demand is not equal to my marginal revenue, but my marginal revenue is equal to my marginal cost, this means my average cost and marginal cost are not equal, which means I'm not producing at the productively efficient level either. This is why it's called imperfect competition. We can also showcase the allocative efficiency by looking at the dead weight loss, which I'm shading in right now. Monopoly looks the exact same. Here's the difference. In the long run, they continue to make their profits. It's going to be this section right here. This is going to be the area of profit. So in the long run, they would maintain this level because there are barriers to 
entry. One other thing to note that comes up a little bit is that they do produce in the elastic region. And the reason why is very simple. Marginal revenue equal to marginal cost. When marginal revenue is positive, you're elastic. You never have a negative marginal cost curve. It's never going to be negative down here. So you always produce in the elastic region. But they'd like to because that way when they decrease their price, they also increase their total revenue. Natural monopoly, <clears throat> we have three points of reference here. The monopoly price, you produce a marginal revenue equal marginal cost, and then you price at your demand curve. Fair return price, that's going to be where you break even, so demand equal to average cost. This would be one of the regulated outputs. And last is the social optimum, that's going to be where you produce a marginal cost equal to demand. You just need to memorize these, um, and that's about it. Last market structure is game theory or is oligopoly and there's the kink demand curve and if there's tight collusion they look like a monopoly but so the typical one you look at that's exclusive to oligopolies is game theory. So you play a big game of what if. What if company X prices high? Well then company Y has a choice to price high and get $200 or price low and get $250. They'd rather get $250. If price X or company X prices low, did they price high and get 100 or price low and get 400? 400. So because it's consistent, no matter what, we call that a dominant strategy. Then we go the other route. What if company Y prices high? Company X could price high and get 200 or low and get 175. Well, 200. What if company Y prices low? 75 or 350? 350. So they do not have a dominant strategy because it's not consistent. So if all information is known, they do not act in collusion, they're going to end up at this spot, this bottom right-hand corner. Because company X knows company Y will default to the dominant strategy, they'll pick accordingly. This is also referred to as a Nash equilibrium because there's no reason for them to deviate away from their choice. Easy way to find this out is when you do the what if scenario, if there's two boxes here, that's a Nash equilibrium. Typically zero, one, or two Nash equilibriums per unit. Um, that's a typical. However, if all information is known, they act in collusion, where would they end up? Well, here you just pick the obvious choice. Where would they rather be? 200, 200, 250, 75? No, they'd rather be actually at the same spot. You pick the one where they would agree. Just take a step back. Man, I'd agree to the 400. Really, you don't want 250 or 200, 100? You sure? Yeah. Okay. Last little bit of topic. Uh, actually, there's two more after this. Is a resource market perfect and imperfect competition? For perfect competition, we have again a side by side graph here industry, market. Now, instead, the marginal revenue product, which is the additional revenue gained when you hire a new unit of resource, typically uh, labor. So how much did you gain? So that's going to become our demand. These guys are wage takers, wage receivers, whatever the industry goes for. That's going to what's happening over here. So you hire at output Q and you pay them wage W. Then we have the monopsony or the imperfectly competitive market. So we produce at marginal resource cost or marginal factor cost or marginal labor costs, all interchangeable, equal to MRP. So we're going to produce or hire L amount of people, and we're going to pay them wherever they were willing to work for. And L amount of people were willing, supply curve, to work for at price W. Uh, you can also identify the perfect competition, also um, inclusive unions. For instance, they want to produce at the perfectly competitive markets. That's going to be right here, where your supply is equal to the MRP, because in perfect competition, our supply becomes our MRC. You can also identify the exclusive or craft union which is at point L, they want to get the highest pay. So at point L, you go up to the marginal revenue product. So from here, point X, 
to point W, that would be what's called the negotiated range for unions. It'd end up somewhere in that mix with a whole bunch of conversations in between. For the minimum wage controversy, the issue is this. Does it increase or decrease unemployment rates? And that's where it gets a little confusing. Depending on how you draw the graph and how large, it can actually increase or decrease. For instance, here, if we have a minimum wage of 30, well, we're actually going to have a lot fewer people gained. If we have it at 40, we'll actually have more people working because our MRP equal to MRC is not going to be at, at unit 4. What if we increase the whole bunch to 60? Then our MRP equal to MRC is going to happen way here over at unit 2, which means we've now increased unemployment. This amount of people want to work. We have six people who want to work, but only two people get to. Whereas here, four people want to work and four people get to. This is because at a minimum floor, okay, when you have a price uh, floor like this or a price, sorry, a price ceiling, uh, like a minimum wage, um, that becomes your MRC. You make it act as if they're in perfect competition. So you go straight across, kind of like the kink demand curve. And then once you go to here, oh, I'm only willing to work for that much more. You have to go to the original MRC curve. Last thing is externalities. We have positive and negative externalities. So here with the marginal private cost, effectively our supply curve, and marginal private benefit, our demand curve. But then we have externalities. So the equation I like to use is marginal private, whatever it is, benefit, cost, plus the externality, meaning the third party, equals the marginal social, whatever else, benefit, cost. So for negative directionality, there's an increase in cost towards the third party, the people who actually weren't buying it. So we would want there to be less produced. That's why we say there's an overproduction of resources. There's an overallocation of resources. So we have a deadweight loss of this blue area, this blue triangle. On the positive side of things, there's an additional benefit. We want there to be more produced. So we're currently underproducing. We're producing at Q1. We want there to be Q2 amount of resources because that's where my marginal social benefit equals my marginal social cost. So this goes into things like the Coase theorem as far as should the government intervene or not. In the case of negative externalities, you can do things like increase taxes increase regulation. If there's a subsidy, take that away or decrease it. For positive externalities, decrease taxes, maybe, maybe not. Uh, increase subsidies, very likely, or you can also make it a public good, just like public education is public. It's a good idea to have a, some kind of an education to some degree. Let's make it so that everybody gets it, hence public education. Very last thing I promise is the Lawrence curve. Not anything you do anything with, but something to identify. So we have the line of equality, which is usually not drawn on here, but it's always this 45 degree angle. And this shows that the percent of the households, if we have 20% of the households, they would have gotten 20% of the income. If you start at zero, account for everybody else, and once you get to 100, you have account for 100% of the income of the nation, region, city, area, whatever you're talking about. But how far removed are you from this 45 degree angle? The larger the gap, the more inequality there is for the income. And we talk about a thing called a Gini coefficient. If you have a Gini coefficient of one, that is perfectly unequal. If you have a zero, that would be perfectly equal. Hope that helps. Until next time. Bye.